Before we get to today's episode, we want to introduce you to our newest partner, which, like us, is Pure South Florida. That's Doral Toyota, where you can find all of your favorite Toyota models, whether you're looking for a new, used, or certified pre-owned vehicle. Doral Toyota is located at 9775 Northwest 12th Street. That's 9775 Northwest 12th Street, just a few blocks from International and Dolphin Malls. Experience the Doral difference, which means four years of complimentary maintenance and roadside assistance on all new vehicles. Also, in-house financing is available for credit-related issues. If you mention five reasons when you call 305-680-1129, that's 305-680-1129, or stop into the dealership, you work with a dedicated manager, not a salesman. Unlike other dealers, Doral Toyota prides itself on an honest and transparent buying process. That's Doral Toyota, DoralToyota.com, or stop in at 9775 Northwest 12th Street. Vamos! Let's go! Welcome into the latest episode of the Five Reasons Podcast. I'm Ethan Skolnick here, as always, with Chris Whittingham. I want to ask you one favor now that you found us. Make sure that you hit the follow button. You can do that on either iTunes or Google Play or Spotify or Podbean or CastBox or any of the many apps that we are on. You'll either see follow or subscribe. The reason that you want to do that, other than the fact that it helps us expand, is also that it will make sure that you get every episode. The old episodes, you can find them, and also all of the new episodes. If you turn on notifications, you will get the new episode as soon as it posts. Also want to make sure that you get our next Heat Stories episode, which is coming up next week. It's with Brian Grant. We did that sit down already. It's really good. He talks about his Heat career, the rest of his NBA career, and also his struggle with Parkinson's disease. Check out the rest of the podcast on our network. That's Miami Heat Beat, Balls Cast, Pitch Invasion, and also Three Yards Per Carry on the Dolphins. And we have five more podcasts that are launching in July. We have a big launch week coming up next week. You want to catch that Monday, Goldie on Ice, Tuesday, The Fish Tank with O.J. McDuffie and Seth Levitt, and Wednesday, Fantasy on Five. All right, let's get back to our Heat Free Agency episodes. We did two earlier this week on NBA Free Agency. We're going to do a little bit on the Heat today, and then we're going to sort of zero in on Free Agency as a whole. And what we're going to do today, Chris, is we're going to play Reward or regret in terms of all of these contracts that have been signed so far in free agency. But we want to start by putting it into a heat context. So for part one, we're going to look back. We're going to look at the heat contracts that currently exist and whether it was for the heat reward or regret. You want to get started here? Let's do it. All right. So let's go with the first guy here. And this was a trade that the heat made. I don't want to evaluate the trade itself because we've talked about that quite a bit. Obviously, the Heat lost two first-round picks in that trade, but circumstances were a little tough for Miami at that point because when they made the trade for Goran Dragic, traded the two first-round picks, they thought they would have Chris Bosh. Within hours of the trade for Goran Dragic, it went from elation to disappointment when we found out that Bosh had the blood clots. And obviously, that led to eventually, after the next season, to Chris Bosh ending his Heat career. Now we're going to see if he comes back somewhere else. Topic for another day. But as far as the Goran Dragic trade, we've kind of talked about that a lot. Want to get into the contract itself. The contract was five years for $85 million for Goran Dragic. He took a little bit less money than he could have had otherwise. Miami made the move for Dragic, believing that he was going to re-sign. They were kind of committed to him re-signing at that point, and he played well enough in his short stint with Miami to justify the contract. When you look back, Chris, reward or regret? I would say, okay, so these are these are two different questions. So the first bit of the question, which is, would you, in retrospect, give up a top seven protected pick and an unprotected pick in exchange for Goran Dragic? For me, the answer is no. Because if you just sort of think about it in the modern context, right? If you said right now to the San Antonio Spurs, we'll give you a top seven protected pick and an unprotected pick, you wouldn't have to do that much more to go and get Kawhi Leonard. You wouldn't have to part with everything that you have in order to go and do that. And so I think if you're going to give up that amount in a trade, you need to get a franchise-changing top two on your team level player. And I think that he could have done that trade still with maybe another of their other players or something else that didn't require two minimally protected first-round picks. And so on that note, 
I don't think that he did well in that regard. And I wouldn't have been able to see it at the time, and that certainly makes me captain hindsight because I was someone who was so desperate for them to find a new point guard, that, and I really like Goran Dragic's game, that I thought they did well in that trade. But in retrospect, I don't think you do that. On the contract, it's fine. I think if you kind of look at the other contracts in the NBA at that position, I don't think you're doing that poorly. And so, to me, when you kind of look at where he ranks in the league and where the Heat rank in terms of spending on their point guards, I don't think it's bad at all. I would say that was a reward, albeit a slight one, because maybe for playing, if, if he's your second highest paid player, maybe he needs to be a little bit better and a bit more reliable, particularly at the end of games. But that's kind of how I break down. The compensation on the trade, reward, uh, regret, I'm sorry, and the contract, reward. Yeah, here's where I come down on this. Uh, you know, again, the trade, I'm going to give the Heat a break on that. I, I understand that you don't never want to give up two first-round picks if you can avoid it, and we know that the Heat you know, at times can be a little lax with the draft picks because Riley says the draft doesn't matter. But I have no issue with them making that trade at the time. Again, you were trying to recover from LeBron leaving. You had an opportunity to get a guy who had been third team all NBA. This is Riley's MO to go after. The, I don't want to call Goran disgruntled. It's hard to really think of him ever as disgruntled. He, he was at the time, though. He was unhappy with the direction. And, and I understood that because they had three damn point guards on the roster. Right. Like they, they were playing Goran at the small forward position at times because they had Isaiah and Eric Bledsoe. So it was just poor planning on the team's part. So, yeah, but he was a little bit of a depressed asset, not as depressed as some of the other ones that the Heat have gone after. But I don't have any issue with it because, again, if, if Bosch is healthy, I think that thing looks totally different. Like the whole purpose of getting Goran Dragic was to get him to play with Chris Bosch. And because Dragic and Channing Fry were the best pick and pop combination in the league the previous year. And, and Chris Bosch is a much better version of Channing Fry. So, I mean, that thing, I remember talking to Channing Fry about it um, and him saying after Goran was traded to, to Miami and, and Channing saying they're going to be incredible together. Like uh, there was that belief. So uh, that never really materialized uh, in part because Bosch got sick and then uh, and then it, they just never really went to it enough early the next season. We were waiting for it. It never really happened. I don't blame them for the trade. As far as the contract goes, you know, I'm looking at uh, Spotrack right now. Goran's average salary for that contract, uh, $17 million, mm -hmm. 61st in the league. And 13th amongst point guards. But he's beneath Dennis Schroeder, which you'd have to say is, you know, in, in that sort of context is really good and then he but he's above so the, the the next guys in line are wall reggie jackson tony parker eric bledsoe brandon knight ricky rubio jeremy lynn jordan clarkson so i guess on the he's money you're doing he's better well. than all of those guys except yeah. wall and and, yeah. and wall the difference is forty three thousand dollars a year so i <laughs> right, right? So basically <laughs> on the same money Right. So, I mean, I, and wall circumstances are different. Uh, I mean, he's behind uh, Biombo, Noah, Alan Crabb, mm -hmm. George Hill. There are so many bad contracts in the league. Uh, uh, so right. many bad contracts. So Danilo Gar not Gallinari, Chandler Parsons. I mean, these guys are all making four, five, six, seven, eight million dollars a year more than him. And, you know, Drew Holiday, who I like a lot and had a very good second half of the season last year, was dynamic, is making, uh, on average, $9 million more per year than Goran Dragic. He's not $9 million better than Goran Dragic. So, I, you know, even and Mike Conley, I mean, if you want to go further, Mike Conley is making thirteen and a half more per year. I say a reward. I think it's a good contract. It's a movable contract. Goran's a good player. He's a good citizen. Like, I... To me, I, the Heat got that one right. I, I'm I'm fine with that one. With that being said, I've said that if you have to trade him to get someone like Kawhi, you do. But the contract, but there's a reason that San Antonio would be interested in that contract. It's a good contract. It's not it's not one of the Heat's bad contracts. So let's get to those. Let's get to the ones that are more problematic for Miami. Tyler Johnson. Regret. Right. Uh, <laughs> and, and and it's not because Tyler's gotten worse or because he's been a problem like Hassan's or, been a problem. Or even time. if you just took his contract, which was four years, 50, and you had it flat, right? You had it 12 mm -hmm. and a half million every year. It's still not great, but it wouldn't be offensive. Mm -hmm. Right. But at the moment, it's offensive. Yes. Um, and, and I think when you take a look at, you know, where he stands in the league right now, I'm looking this up uh, as we speak. It's I mean, it's incredibly problematic. I mean, $19 million a year. Let me just see where this puts him. Uh, he's 44th in the league right now. Now, some new contracts have to be signed, but some extensions have been signed. And Tyler makes, we talk about John Wall on average. Tyler, for next season, will make $90,000 more than John Wall. Yeah, it's crazy. It's insane. So, yeah, it's it's really problematic. And, and I hate doing this because, again, Tyler hasn't done anything wrong other than sign the contract. And... 
we can say that maybe he could have made things a little easier for the Heat. I, I know that some stories have come out that he didn't want to spread the contract out over four years. He just wanted to sign what it was. There's also been stories that have come out that this was really more Mickey's decision than Pat's decision. Um, but any way that you look at it, uh, it's a huge problem. Here's the biggest issue with it, which is, again, not his fault. You and I are taping this podcast after you just posted a highlight stream of Derek Jones Jr. dunks, right? Yep. This is my whole problem with what the Heat have done here over the past two years. And again, it's sort of a backhanded compliment. They're really good at finding those guys, really good. So I don't understand why they pay them once they do. That's the part that doesn't make any sense. I mean, you can say, well, you have to show that you're a generous organization, but you didn't do that with Dwayne Wade. Like, so, <laughs> so, you, do, so you, do, you don't have to do it with this type of player who's a good player, but not a franchise changing sure. player. And, and, and I, because, because again, if the Brooklyn Nets had this contract, they wouldn't be in love with it either. Right? No. Like, you're, you're like, you basically let other teams make the mistake. And by the way, Tyler Johnson would not have been mad at the Heat. If he went to Brooklyn no. and and could, because the Heat got him that fifty million, T Tyler Johnson was literally a zero commodity when he arrived at the Heat Shores, and if basically for a year and a half's worth of service he earned himself fifty million dollars, mm -hmm. then you can do nothing to the Heat organization but say thank you very much, and the which Heat, he would and, have, and and the but Heat and the Heat get to put that on their resume as job well done. Right, the Heat can find role guys like this is mm -hmm. what their staff not just the coaching staff, but the front office, like they're really good at this stuff. So just find new role guys. And, and now you have a situation where you have a Derek Jones Jr. who looks like, and I don't know why Phoenix let him go, because it's not like they had to pay him, uh, which is a different conversation than what you and I are having here. Now they have a guy in Derek Jones Jr. who looks like he's ready to contribute in some way, and he's blocked by seven other wings on the roster who are all making so much, not all, but except for Magruder, are all making so much money that it's going to be hard to to move them. And now, so what you may end up having to do is move Magruder somewhere, like for a protected second round pick, just to clear out some space from Derek Jones Jr. when Magruder would be providing good value to you at one and a half million dollars. So this is the philosophy that I, I just don't know how they ended up in this place because it doesn't make a lot of sense for them. All right, so we're going to move to three other guys here, Chris. We're going to try to hit these a little bit quicker. Hassan Whiteside, four years, $98 million in 2016. Contract this season will be 25 $5.4 million. I've actually done some research, right? So I went back and looked at my viewpoint at the time, right? So I went back and looked. Uh, you can search on Twitter if you find the right keywords to go and find your tweets in the time. And I was a bit more positive than I thought it was. I still thought there was plenty of risk in it, but I still thought at the time I felt okay with them you know, basically saying there was another team that was there for the leverage. To me, the thing that is the commonality between all of these is that there was a leverage team. But the reason why the answer for most of these is regret is that the leverage team wouldn't like that deal either. So if Dallas had gotten him, if the Knicks had gotten Deion Waiters, if, as we just talked about with Tyler Johnson, the Brooklyn Nets had got him, they would not be in love with those deals. And so I think this idea that the Heat, I think, have employed over the last couple of years, which is if we don't keep this asset, then we lose him for nothing. Well, not necessarily you lose him for nothing. You lose him for the potential salary cap space. And that's been the answer to all of these questions is you preserve the flexibility above anything else. So yes, the answer is regret. I do think that there's a bit too much hyperbole around how bad he is as it relates to the regular season. If you look at his numbers, his points per 36 minutes numbers were up. His rebounds per 36 minutes were up. Only the blocks were down, and he doesn't have the highlight real plays that make you remember why you fell in love with him in the first place. But in the end, his role in the playoffs made you regret that signing and regret that signing in a big way, and that's what the answer is in the end. I'm going to go with you on this part. I was not that down on it at the time either. Now, it's obviously regret now. It's huge regret. But I was not that down on it. I actually wrote columns in the Herald about how Hassan had worked really hard. And so he sold me on it. I had a conversation with him where he talked about it. He's like, if I wouldn't work hard, how the hell did I get out of the situation I was in? And so I bought that. And I think the Heat bought that. And what the Heat kept telling me about him was not whether, they, not whether he worked hard, but whether he worked smart, whether he worked with. I heard that all the time. Whether he worked for the, in other words, smart for the purposes of the team, not just for himself. Like they had no issue with like Hassan spending time, you know, in the training room, in the workout room, right? Like he does that. Okay. Like they, they didn't have any concern about that. 
They wanted to know, would he be there with other players? Would he be working with other players? They talked about working with, would he be the guy that when his teammate fell on the floor that he went and picked him up? Like this was the kind of stuff they talked about. Like they were concerned about those kind of things. And so they were concerned too about when he got the money. If not that he would stop working entirely, but that little things would start to bother him more and he would feel more entitled. That was a word I heard a lot from people inside the organization. He would feel entitled to touches. He would feel entitled to a leadership position. He would feel entitled to speaking his mind. And so that kind of stuff came out. And I think, unfortunately, their fears have been confirmed on that. You're, you're correct about his per minute numbers. Um, his per minute numbers, you're right, were better than they were the previous regular season. But he's playing less because the coach trusts him less. And also because the style of the league has moved in a different direction, as you've outlined. And so that's where we are. So I don't think there's any question that there's regret. I still think another team can make good use of him in some way. But it's pretty clear now, particularly with what we're seeing from BAM and Summer League, that this team has, at least in its head, moved on. The question is, will they be able to move on on the salary cap sheet? All right, let's get to two more here, and then we're going to go to the league. Dion Waiters, last summer. You mentioned that the Knicks had interest. We've had Brian Windhorst on the pod. Now, again, this one is four years 50. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so we had we had Brian Windhorst on the pod And he told us, and Brian knows the league as well as anybody. He talks to more people in the league than anybody I know. And he said that there was no, there might have been teams interested, but there was no team willing to go four years for him. Mm -hmm. And the Knicks were not. And so, and I know that the Knicks and the Lakers came up as possibilities. I know the Lakers were not willing to go that long because as you know, and it's played out this summer, they were not extending anybody anywhere near that long. They, they signed for Dion's position. They signed Contavious Caldwell Pope as a LeBron play to get clutch on their side for one year. Right. So Dion could have gone to the Lakers or the Knicks, but if he went to the Lakers, it would have been like a one year, $18 million deal. It would not have been four years. Okay. And I don't believe the Knicks would have given him four years either. That was not the direction Scott Perry and Steve Mills were going in last summer either. Okay. So that's the part to me, this is absolute regret. And it doesn't even have to do with the ankle, although the ankle plays into this because I I don't really understand how the heat committed this much to him when they kind of knew he'd be useless to them last season. That one doesn't make any sense. But the biggest thing to me is I I just don't, I don't understand the years. I I don't understand the years. I mean, we're talking about a guy who had, has had one really good month in OKC and two and a half really good months in Miami Mm -hmm. that LeBron wanted out of Cleveland that didn't fit with Kyrie that has a game that requires usage. And it almost strikes me that they did it. Here's my theory on this. I think they did it because he, for a moment in the 2016, 17 season made people forget about Dwayne. That's my theory on this, that there were, there were moments in there, particularly the golden state game, the crossing of the arms and all that. Like he played the role of Dwayne for a short period of time. And this organization needed desperately to replace Twain. And so they said, well, here's the closest facsimile. He's younger. He's kind of healthier, but he needs ankle surgery, which he hasn't had yet because he wants to make money as a free agent. We're going to sign him. And so that, that to me is, I think they made an emotional decision there based on the 30 and 11. And I think also Mm -hmm. Chris, that last week where they fell apart last two weeks where they fell apart without him and missed the playoffs because of a couple of bad losses. I think that weighed too heavily on them. And I think that's why they made the decision that and the Dwayne thing. Now I've kind of come around on ISO basketball because you saw a lot of it in the playoffs. And I think you saw in the switching era, how important being a good ISO player is going to be. I just aesthetically don't like watching it. And so I'm kind of a I'm biased here. I do think that healthy Deion Waiters helps the Heat. I do think healthy Deion Waiters gives this current roster something that that it doesn't have. But the question is, could you find that in other places? So again, Tyreek Evans taking twelve million dollars this year with the Pacers on one year. To me, Deion Waiters level talent is available for one or two years. Fred Van Vliet, two years, eighteen million to stay with Toronto. To me, just go up at Marco Bellinelli who killed you in the playoffs last year two years 12 million to go to san antonio again if there is preservation of cap space you can do better than what even mario hazonia who has yet to really get his career off the ground you you stick him on the heat and see if it works he's at one year six and a half million like there's just too many players that are on lower money on lower years that 
would be a far, I don't know, a more economical as, as a way of putting it. I'm not necessarily saying better. I'm saying far more economical. And given the fact that you're not winning the championship, preserving flexibility is most important. And I, I just can't believe that on emotion, that on thinking that 13 11, that team could actually make a run that was any way meaningful. I, there were Heat fans that were carried away and thought that that team could go on a run. If anyone in that organization thought that run was in any way meaningful and any way thought that you could win the East as a virtue of that, those 41 games, man, they were suckered because there just, there just wasn't a way. Like NBA math for 50 years has told us that you need – far more talent than what the Heat had. And so I think this is another case of them falling in love with themselves. And this is another contract that's, we found the reclamation project. How many teams tried him? How many teams traded him? They couldn't make it work. We did. So we are basically, it's sort of self-aggrandizing in a way, isn't it? To just basically pick up a guy and, and give him a bunch of money because we fixed him. That's basically what it is, isn't it? It is. And it comes back to a point I've made before. It is self-aggrandizing, but it's also not giving enough credit to one person which is your head coach yep. at, at which which uh, well you know. it is giving credit to the job that he did but you're basically not giving him the credit that he can go again right and and he has gone again and he would go again and we talked about Tyreek Evans we're going to get into some of these contracts that have been signed now but there's no doubt in my mind they could have done the same thing with Tyreek Evans why four why not two with a, with a team option why not three with a team option why four years I just because you thought you could move him, but we're going to get to some of the contracts, which is why I think it's going to be harder than they thought. All right, two more quickies here. I, to me, this one we can do really quickly. Josh Richardson reward, right? Yep. I mean, four, four years, $41 million. The only player other than Bam Adebayo is on a rookie deal that represents value on the Heat roster. Correct. Okay, so we don't need to focus on that much. I mean, he, it was a good deal. It was a good extension. I think Josh on a, on a really good team can be your third best player. Uh, again, he can be your third best player and you can be effective. Dion is your third best player. I don't think it works. So I, I think... That's a great deal for them. All right, last one, James Johnson, four years, 60. And the fourth year is, is a player option. Yep. Um, that last year is a, is a player option, which in 2029, 20, I'm sorry, 2020, 21 is $15.8 million. It's a lot of money. Age 33 is going to be then. Again, I, I mean, how, many, I mean, how many James Johnsons could you find right now? Would you rather have, would you rather have Jeff Green on one year, 2.39 yes. million to the Wizards than James Johnson, four years, 60? Would you rather, here's another one for you. We're going to get into this contract. Would you rather have Julius Randle on two years at 18? Oh, God, yeah. I'd, I'd rather have... At, I, at, I'd, at 24 years old? I'd rather have Derek Favors on two years, 36. Absolutely. And again, this is not a slight to James Johnson. He's a very useful player when he's utilized correctly. And But again, sports Bose the first one to unlock that, right? Yep. Like he'd been with seven, was six teams, seven teams. His previous uh, team, the Toronto Raptors, had relegated him to the bench to not play in playoff games because they preferred to use Norman Powell against the Heat. Yeah. Against the Heat. I mean, they did use him against LeBron, but they didn't use him in that. So a couple of things. I'm just again trying to find the justification for this one. Uh, one I don't uh, even I don't even remember the leverage then I don't No, the leverage was Utah supposedly but I but 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 and and here was the other leverage the leverage was he had the same agent as Gordon Hayward um and so I think uh, again this is not based on information but I'm just going through it at the time they were dealing with Gordon's agent uh remember JJ was the one who committed first like he wanted to be in Miami he made that clear right and mm -hmm. they love that OK, so, I mean, he bought into the culture more than anybody else. I mean, he was wearing culture T-shirts all summer. Right. So they, he bought into it. He was trying to get Gordon here. They appreciate that. They have the same agent. So it, and then uh, coincidentally, Utah was also the team that had interest in. James right. I, I'm, I'm, lo I'm looking at the story right now. Uh, and it's bad. Yeah. I mean, you can see how you know, qu how quickly that came together where league sources and, mm -hmm. you know, free agent forward, they have the same agent. Voila, there's leverage. I mean, it's le 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 league source is the agent. Uh, just for <laughs> fans out there, league source is the agent. OK, yeah. I did this for 20 years. League Except source is the I, agent. I do. I do know of a local team that breaks news to its local press yes. and and the name of the source changes. Uh, oh, 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 teams, do, teams do it, yeah. too. And teams. Teams use certain reporters. Uh, there's I don't get into specifics here, but there are certain reporters when they're criticizing a Heat player, I know it's coming from the team um, because I, I know which reporters the team might. And I'm not saying 
I'm not saying a specific person, but there are people inside the organization that will utilize certain people in the media. Again, I don't want to get specifics on this, but the Dolphins do it a lot. Uh, the, the GM of the Dolphins does it a lot. Okay, it was done during the Jarvis Landry stuff. So it's it's done. But typically, league sources, the way this works is you'll see, I mean, this is always happens at the beginning of free agent. These eight teams are interested in so-and-so. <laughs> okay, so you're telling you're telling me that the reporter is canvassing 30 teams <laughs> and finding out that these eight, okay, he, he, they're <laughs> reaching, he's reaching Kevin Pritchard and Masai Ujiri directly and finding out that, they, and they're telling them, we have an interest in this player. No, the agent is creating a market. That's how this works. And so I think getting back to the James Johnson discussion, it's pretty clear that to a certain extent, the Heat were used as a fallback option, okay, for their guy. And Utah was used as a fallback option for their guy. And so what ends up happening is the Heat sign James Johnson to what amounts to a way above market contract in terms of years and in terms of money. I think the other thing that swayed them, again, just a guess, but kind of an educated guess here, is the same thing I talked about with Deion Waiters. Those last two weeks of that regular season when they were chasing the playoffs, James Johnson was great. Yeah, great. They put him in the starting lineup and he started putting up starter numbers like he was. I, I'll have to look, but he was averaging like 20 and nine during that period of time with four or five assists. Like he was putting up like Paul George numbers. OK, at, at the, at, during that. I'm not going to say LeBron, but it was like Paul George numbers he was putting up. And so I think that swayed them, too. I think they got caught up in the chase and they were like, wow, James Johnson can do that. Like, we don't want to let that again, like you said, we don't want to let that guy go. And if we have to, we'll move him. But again, I to me, it's regret. And I like him as a player, but I, you, you can't the, the money when he's going to be 34 at the end of it. It's just hard to justify. All right. So let's get to the next part of this, Chris. And we're going to get away from the heat a little bit, although everything we do is kind of in a heat context. So I'm going to give you reward or regret. We're going to go through these contracts. Um, if people want to follow along at home, go to Spotrack.com. That's not for Eric Spolstra. That's uh, <laughs> it's called, it's I'm starting to think that it is. <laughs> it, it, it could be S S P O. T-R-A-C dot com. Let's go through it. Chris Paul stays in Houston. Four years, $159,730,000. I'm going to say that the Rockets are going to end up regretting that one. Now, they had to do it because kind of like what we talked about earlier with Dragic, they made the trade and Chris Paul could have opted out and signed an extension with the Los Angeles Clippers for basically the same amount of money, if not a little bit more. But I think Chris Paul was already destined towards being a player that would not age very well. And I think this only makes it worse. I think you're going to end up paying Chris Paul like $45 million in the final year of that deal to basically either you're going to start him out of obligation or you're going to have him come off the bench because I don't think his is a game, particularly given his injury history, that will age well. I think this is going to be definite regret. I think they're going to regret it by year two. Actually, I don't think it's going to take them four years. It's you mentioned it. He has trouble staying healthy. He's still elite. He's still elite when he plays. And we saw if he'd stayed healthy in the Western Conference Finals. You talk about a team being guided by emotion right now. If he'd stayed healthy in the Western Conference Finals, they might have gone to the finals. You think they would have. I don't. But who knows? We will never know because they were up three, two in that series. I tend to think Golden State only cares when they're down. But we would have seen what would have happened. But to me, I would have prioritized Clint Capella. And so. I think there'll be more regret. I, I will say if though, they don't I, resign Capella. I do think they're in a good position though on Capella, and maybe I'll come. To, I'll come to regret that. But the restricted free agent market for me is totally dried up. So I think they're going to end up cons- extending Capella, and I think they're going to get him at a good price because right now Clint Capella has zero leverage. I hate restricted free agency. By I, the agree way. I, I, I agree too. I agree too. I think I, I think it screwed I, a lot of players in the league. It's a terrible system. It's a terrible system. The players. I, I don't know why they haven't. They've fought, they've fought hard on a lot of things. I don't get it. We don't see players move. It always ends up in a dispute. It seems like the best case scenario for the other team is you screw a team in the league. Kind of like That's what it. kind of like what, you know, Brooklyn did with the Miami Heat basically with Tyler right. Johnson or, you know, some other poison pills that have happened in the league. That's basically all you can do is, oh, let me see if I can just screw around with another team in the league. It's a terrible deal that the NBA has. And and, and we've seen with Tristan Thompson or Eric Bledsoe or Draymond Green, like it just it does not work very well. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna say regret. Like I said, I think it'll be regret by year two. LeBron James, four years, 153 million, three hundred twelve thousand dollars. Do we need to I mean, I I mean, do we need to really? No, <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> okay. uh, I, I mean, I, I, I think they've already made that franchise. The 153 million, I think they've made it in the last two days. I, I would not 
Uh, <laughs> I will say though, there. Th- did you see the video of the of the uh, picture of like there's a mural of Kobe Bryant and someone put LeBron's face over it and someone one of the Kobe stands actually d- got off Twitter for one second and threw a shoe at it so that l- the it was basically like a piece of paper that was stuck on- over this mural and uh, someone threw a shoe until it came off. So it would remain a mural of Kobe. Those people are crazy. There's only one cult in the country that's stronger than the Kobe <laughs> cult. I'm not going to say it here. All right. uh, Nikola Jokic. It's, uh, it's, it's the Justice Winslow cult, by the way. Uh, uh, Justice better. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that, that, that one or the other one. Uh, Nikola Jokic, five years, $147,710,000. I'll start here. Uh, I say the reward. I love him as a player. Uh, I agree. He's, he, he's 23. He needs to get better defensively, but he's as skilled as... An offensive center as there in the, is in the league. He does everything. I like that team's makeup. Again, they need more defenders uh, if they're going to go anywhere. I think they've got a shot at a three or four seed this year. I like Mike Malone as a coach. I, I love Jokic as a player. Now, uh, now I, I will say Alf did give me a lot of crap for saying that uh, the, on, on our, our Alf and Alf podcast that Denver can feel positive because they have Jokic, but I think he's that good. The one thing, though, that concerns me, he is a terrible defender. And yes. so... It is a massive concern that as bigs get run off the floor in mm-hmm. every playoff series, it's going to be hard to envision him playing against the Warriors and the Rockets when if you even try to to switch him onto someone, I don't think he can even guard at a Kevin Love level, much less at a competent level. So that would be my concern is... Yes, you're paying this. You're paying this guy a lot of money to win you regular season games, but come playoff time, are teams going to attack him? The answer is yes. I would like to see him be able to adjust and get better, so that that doesn't happen to him as much. He's 23. Uh, there's time. I, I'm not saying he's going to be a great defender, but I mean, you could look. Chris Bosh came to Miami, and he's admitted he was not a good defender when he came to Miami. Um, he became a good defender. Mike Malone can coach defense. So I, I just. Uh, it's just weird. Denver teams have never been good defensively. I don't know if it's the altitude or what, but yeah. uh, it's always been interesting to me the style. Maybe, maybe, uh, sty- maybe stylistically, you you work on playing with pace and playing with scoring because you can blitz teams out of your home gym when they come to altitude. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would be that would be the reason. But look, I, I love him as a player, and I think you know as long as Millsap can defend competently, and and we'll see what happens when he ages. They'll be okay there. Um, their guards need to get better defensively too. So. Uh, that's a bit of a concern, but uh, but I like the contract. All right, Paul George, uh, four years, one hundred and thirty seven million dollars to stay in OKC. He's twenty eight. Um, I'll let you go first on this one. You have to look at it in totality, right? So with Oklahoma City, you have a team that's way over the luxury tax, right? So they're going to be the first ever team that right now on salary and on tax would pay. $300 million for their team, for a team that's not even that good. So, again, it's a total victory that Oklahoma City got Paul George to come back. But I think that in the grand scheme of things, if their, vict- if their goal is to win the Western Conference, this team is currently constructed isn't good enough. They might be slightly overpaying Steven Adams, though I think he's a good player. But with the Carmelo salary, with not enough else around them, I don't think that they're good enough to really compete at the highest level. So I think while this is a victory, you took a risk and it paid off, I'm not sure that he's actually going to help you win in a significant way. I'll say reward because of context. Sure. Now, now I, I didn't love him next to Westbrook last year. I don't know that that's going to get better. I, I wonder, you know, as Russ ages uh, and can't go a million miles an hour, if maybe that might be good for Russ's game and then good for Paul George's collaboration with him. But I don't know. I don't know how Westbrook's going to adjust his game. Like we saw Dwayne adjust his game. I don't know if that's. I don't know if Westbrook's capable of that. And I'm not. So I don't know where that goes. But again, OKC has to do this. Um, it's just difficult to get guys to go there. And so sure. if you've got a star who's willing to stay, now you look back at this and you say, if they had just paid James Harden $4 million more, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, mean, I mean, that's I mean, look how much money this it's cost them because of that. Yeah. Like if, if they had just extended James Harden instead of getting cheap and trading him for 10 cents on the dollar, uh, I mean... You know, maybe Durant doesn't leave because you have a big three that would rival any big three in history. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, I mean, in terms of its age, 
And they made a choice of Ibaka over Harden, and then they didn't want to pay Harden. So, I mean, they're making up for their mistake now, but you kind of have to. I mean, because they can't really bottom out when Russ is there. That's the problem. Sure. So, what, once they paid Russ, you need Unless a Unless you trade ball. Russ, and then, in, and then you get into what kind of proposition that would be. Right. Well, you trade Russ, and then you're basically to a team that can afford him, which isn't many. And then you basically, and, and reality is, any team that can afford him and is going for it now couldn't give you high enough picks mm-hmm. to make it worth it. Right. So, so you're kind of stuck with Russ. I mean, I, legitimately, they're stuck with Russ for yeah. a period of time. And so, and, and I, and with the fan base, that fan base as rabid as it is, sure, they can't. They appreciate that Rush stayed after Durant, so you can't move him. So you need a second star. I mean, there's no point to the whole thing if you don't sure. have a second star. I, so I will I'm, say though, I'm going to say a reward, even though I think Paul George has regressed a little bit. And it's the ultimate triumph for Oklahoma City as an organization because, like you said, you can't get people to come to Oklahoma City, but it does seem like keeping people in Oklahoma City has gotten a lot easier for them because of what they've built. And so credit to them. And mm-hmm. while I, 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 by the way, people will come back at me and say, well, Kevin Durant left. But I think if Golden State did not have a salary cap spike that allowed them to do it, I think yes. he would have stayed. I, I, I really oh, I, I really think that he would have stayed, and he has said that Oklahoma City finished in second. Now, that might not be true, and he maybe you know would have thought to go to Boston or somewhere else, but I, I believe him when he says that Oklahoma City finished second. And so if not for one of the most spectacular you know coincidences or you know bits of fortune in the history of the league, I think Kevin Durant would still be there. So I do think that they deserve immense credit for what they've built. All right, let's get to the next one here. Aaron Gordon. This surprised me a little bit. You talk about restricted free agents. Uh, I, I thought he might get an offer sheet that they wouldn't match because um, they seem to have – I mean, they keep changing their front office, but – uh, Hennigan's not there anymore, and they keep well. They keep changing their coaches anyway. But they're they're at four years, eighty four million for Aaron Gordon. I mean, this is a franchise that has drafted in the past few years. Oladipo moved him uh, to get Ibaka, yep. actually, along with a Sabonis pick. Elford Payton, uh, they moved him. They they kept Fournier on a contract. Uh, I don't really know what their direction is, honestly. I I it's I don't know. They they just they haven't really lucked out in the lottery. And then when they found a player like Oladipo, they haven't figured out how to use him. Yeah, I, I would say on this one, four years, eighty four million dollars. He's only twenty two years old. I would say reward, except I just don't trust anything the Magic do. Yeah, so I. I'm going to say I'm, I don't, I may say regret on this one because, I, again, I, I don't think they've evaluated talent all that well. Uh, Gordon has had moments, but they got to use him right. He's not a three. They have to play him at the four and they just they have to let him run the floor and develop. I, I mean, to me, his upside is Blake Griffin. So if he becomes Blake Griffin or anything close to that, then four years, 84 in this economy is is not bad, but I, I'm, I'm. This is more of a play against. This is kind of like when the Spurs do something, and I just believe it's right. I, I just with the Magic, I, I just, I don't know. I mean, they signed by uh, Bismack Biombo to eighteen million dollars a year. I mean, that, well, that, off, well, that, off, that, off that for one me, playoff, like that, it was crazy. That for me is the problem with them right now. Is they signed Bismack Biombo, they have Nikola Vucevic, and they have they, they just drafted Mo Bamba after drafting Jonathan Isaac. So this team is way too big. And we talk all the time about the Heat having three centers for 48 minutes, right? Because you can't really play. I mean, Adebayo and Olenek together were the only group of bigs that really worked to any extent that was positive. So mm-hmm. I think this team has way too many bigs. Aaron Gordon's a power forward. Like, yes. you, you play him with another big and at maybe even at times a small ball five. Like, I, I, I don't think that... Orlando has ever used him well. They've never gotten a point guard that can really take into, take advantage of his skills. So I think on its own, it's a good deal because I think he's a really good player and I think he has really good potential. But I think in the construct of the Magic, I'm not sure he's going to pan out because they don't have enough at point guard. They've got too many bigs. There's not enough spacing. And I think that would be my biggest concern if I was Orlando. Honestly, that's a team. We talk about the Heat as six guards. Um, if you had any of them that were really tradable, Orlando yeah. would be would be a team you would look at. Like, I mean, right. to me, 
but uh, but I mean, what would you want to return? Would you want Evan Fournier back in return? Like, I, well, Fournier is another two. Sure. I mean, I, I I mean I I would take a chance on Jonathan Isaac's potential, but sure. I oh, yeah, you know but, again, I, I don't know uh, if Orlando would punt on it after a year, but uh, so what they basically have they have well, they punted on Oladipo after two sure. uh, again so, different management team, but still sure they've got Gordon, they've got Biombo, they've got Vucevic, they've got Isaac, they've got Bamba, they've got a uh, former Heat summer league uh, uh, all star Kem Birch. Uh, mm-hmm. So I mean they've they've just got a lot of bigs and not enough minutes for for any of them really. Yeah, it doesn't make a lot of sense. All right, then, next and then, one. And then and then Biombo might be the most disastrous 2016. Co- I mean, and Ma- Mazga for Luol Deng were, but Bismack Biombo is not far away in terms of disasters of the 2016 off season. Off one postseason, it was yeah. it was awful. And I, I, and I, and I love Biombo, and I remember we talked a lot of we talked about him a lot on radio at the time because of because we were on during those playoffs, and then mm-hmm. afterwards I remember. I remember hearing on Kevin Arnovitz's uh, podcast where he was talking about Bismack Biyombo. He was like, "Yeah, I think he's gonna make fifteen million a year in free agency." I nearly spit out my drink when I heard it, and, and then I and then I went on the radio, and you and Wallace thought I was insane, and then he got four years, seventy two, yeah. and it just I think we we all weren't prepared for what twenty sixteen was going to be. Yeah, it's uh, God, that was an awful one. All right, uh, let's go to if we're gonna go five more here real quick. Kevin Durant. Two years, sixty-one point five. Uh, do we need to dwell on this? Um, no, no <laughs> I mean, we don't. No, we don't. No, let's just let's just <laughs> move on. Uh, reward. Uh, Will Will Barton. We talk about Denver. I mean, they've spent a lot of money. Um, he's twenty-seven yeah. years old. Four years, fifty-four million dollars for Will Barton. Risk or re- I keep doing that. Three, <laughs> two, one. Reward or regret? I think Will Barton's a decent player, but this feels like a heat contract. I think this is. Uh, an overpay on a guy that is a good sixth man, is a good off the bench scorer, is is a, we talk about Heat players being ignitable. I think mm-hmm. uh, I think he is a very ignitable player, but I don't think that Will Barton is going to be worth this contract. I'm going to say regret. I think when you look at his numbers. Um... He's kind of plateaued. Uh, that would be my issue with it. Last three years in Denver, he was a nice find, like uh, in the Aflalo trade. Like it was, it was a nice pickup. Uh, you know, Portland was desperate for another, for like a third guard, which they seems like they've been desperate for that forever. So they were desperate for third guard. They made the trade for Aflalo when they're making the playoffs. When you look at the last three years for Barton in Denver, uh, points 14.4, 13.7, 15.7. Shooting, he went from 35% from three to 37 each of the past two years. He's gotten a little bit better uh, from two. He's a good free throw shooter. His rebound numbers have stayed about the same. His assists have gone up a little bit. And his overall metrics have gotten slightly better. But it does feel to me like he had a breakout season. I, and I, again, I hate to do the Tyler thing again here but uh, it feels a little similar to me like you'd say with the heat contract like he had the breakout season it's like okay well this is kind of who he is which is good which is good it's a rotation player uh, but again you're paying for more than a rotation player there and so uh to me it's a little bit to me it's a little bit high um so i, I don't know if they'll have huge regret on this one mm-hmm. like i think this one may be movable this four years 54 because he's young enough Sure. And unlike Dion, he's not injured um, or didn't didn't come in a I mean, season. Tw- Twenty twenty seven isn't that young. No, no, you're right. Um, but he's not. He doesn't rely as much on at, on getting to the basket as Dion does. Like that, that's a huge part of Dion's game. With with Barton, I mean, he he plays inside out, but he. I mean, he plays outside in uh, for the most part. He's mostly a three. You know, he's a three point shooter. He's a three thirty seven percent three point shooter. Can get to the rim a little bit. He's a good player. Um, but yeah, it seems a little high. Derek Favors, you mentioned him earlier. Two years, 36. I'll tell you, this one surprised me because I did not think he was staying in Utah. Like, I, I feel like they were moving away from him the past couple of years. Like, could they continue to play Gobert and Favors together? Yeah. And and then they had some success with it late last season. Particularly in the playoffs. I, I thought it worked okay in the playoffs. I, I thought it did. I've always liked him as a player. He's a very good defender. He's never going to be the offensive player he was projected to mm-hmm. uh, when he was traded from from Brooklyn. But uh, but I I don't know. I, I kind of I, I I'm okay with this one. Like I, I feel like Utah has generally managed its cap situation well. I think uh, it's been proven that the Rodney Hood move they made, like not paying Rodney Hood, probably the right decision. Um, interestingly, if you look at Rodney Hood, if you took away their faces and their their names and you put Deion Waiter's stats next to Rodney Hood, they're the same. They're exactly the same. Like, <laughs> like little, like somebody should just. It's all about timing, man, and that, and that's why I feel bad for favors because mm-hmm. two years, thirty six. What would what would his number be if the same player was available in twenty sixteen? Four years, eighty. Oh yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's a better player than, say, Tristan Thompson. Yeah. Um, right. I agree. I mean, I mean, he's I think, less he, I think the... he could really help another team. I actually think this is one where Utah signs it to trade it because, again, as much as it worked in the playoffs, I, I just think you have 48 minutes for bigs, right, in, mm-hmm. in, in, in the game today. And I think that they could, you know, they could give him to another team that I think he could help a lot more than he helps Utah. Correct. I know I agree with that. Uh, and, and I think Quinn Snyder is a top 10 coach in the league uh, at this point. He might be top five. So I, I do think he, he has a pretty good handle on how to utilize his players. But I'm fine with the contract. It, it's not, uh, again, a lot of this comes down to years. Like to me, like two years at 36, okay, worst case scenario, it's expiring after a year. Like, uh, you know, t- to me, there's, there's just limited risk there. All right, let's get to, uh, let's get to two more. I'm going to skip over Dante Exum because uh, that's still more Utah. Uh, let's get to these two guys. Let's go to Avery Bradley, two years, 25 with the Clippers. Um, <laughs> you know, what's funny is that, uh, I don't know if you saw today, but Michael Wright, the writer for the, uh, for ESPN on the San Antonio Spurs uh, was talking about, uh, Kawhi and how uh, and he has heard that the Clippers are now his preferred destination, but mm-hmm. San Antonio was telling him that he thinks that the Clippers' assets are awful, and so why would you know why would the Spurs ever make a trade with Los Angeles with, with 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 the Clippers right now? And I think he's just another in a long list of I mean because because you also were were someone who thought that maybe you know LeBron would be up to go to the Clippers rather than the Lakers, but you look at their roster, you look at their salary sheet, and it is it's another for me their rosters their their Western Conference Heat aren't they? Like yeah. it's just a, a other than Lou Williams. Not a ton of not a ton of value anywhere on that team. They're paying Danilo Gallinari a ton of money. Uh, Tobias Harris is on a decent deal, but I feel like he's been an overpay in the league for some time. And they just got a lot of these mid-level salaries like Boban. I, not believe me, no one loves Boban more than I do. He's one of my like in terms of fascinating characters in the league. I'm fascinated by Boban, but they're paying him seven million dollars, and mm-hmm. he's he's. I don't want to mean I don't want to you know demean him, but he's a sideshow player, right. and so. I just think that you look up and down their 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 salary sheet. You know they're paying four guys eight figures, and they're Avery Bradley, Marcin Gortat, Tobias Harris, and Danilo Gallinari. Those are all role players. They have mm-hmm. a, they're paying a lot of money for role players. That's the Heat model. I'm generally not not a fan of it. Now on two years, you can't really say that it's that bad of a deal. But um, and and from from what I'm seeing, it doesn't seem like there's a ton of dead money if they wanted to let him go on year two. Uh, so. Yeah, it's only partially guaranteed to one point five million after after next year. So it's basically a one year deal. But uh, I, I I think what I I'm not really entirely sure what the Clippers are trying to do. I'm not either. And again, Jerry West is is in charge there now, and so I'm just curious to see how they change. I mean, they got Doc to trade his son after his son finally broke through. <laughs> well, I think I think the uh, the the lesson there is that Doc Rivers is distinctly not running the show anymore. Right, right. Well, well, that no, that's true. But it's it's interesting because I thought that Austin actually made progress last year and then and then this is when they move him they could have moved him uh you know before i mean they would have moved him for carmelo which that wouldn't have worked out so well anyway uh i'm okay with the contract you're right though i i thought the clippers were a viable option for lebron because he would seem to me would connect with the three people who are in charge which is is balmer uh, jerry west who he adores and admires and uh and doc rivers who we always spoke highly of even when they were going out in the playoffs but then I looked at the roster, and, and just the roster just doesn't have anything there. So I, I, I'm okay with it. But to me, Avery Bradley is a guy who's only effective on a good team. Like, and if the Clippers aren't a good team, I don't see the point. It's kind of like when Courtney Lee went to New York. Like Courtney Lee's fine as as a you know a stopgap two guard on a good team. Like, but you put Courtney Lee on a team where he's got to produce offense. Sure. That's not it's not where you want to be. So Avery Bradley's kind of the same way. Avery Bradley also is an example of the Brad Stevens effect. I mean, we saw four guys last year leave Boston and none of them performed at a high level. And that, um, and that would, well, no, I, actually, I'm, I'm going to take that back. One of them did. One of them did. The guy in Miami, uh, Kelly sure, Olinick, Olinick agreed. Kelly, Kelly Olinick was the best of the four. I actually, I thought, I thought more of him after he left Boston, which you can't save. You can't save a lot of players. Now, maybe that's just my personal bias of just thinking he was a lanky white guy that elbowed people. But, uh, but I, I think, I, I think a lot more of him now than I did when he was in Boston. Yeah. And you know, we forgot to go over him in the heat section of this pod. I, I, I'm that to me, that's a reward contract. That, agreed. Uh, that agreed. Kelly Olinick contract. That one. So, so there are three and four in the seven contracts that we went through. All right, one more here um, that we're going to go through. Uh, Ursan Ilyasova, uh, three years, $21 million, 
to Milwaukee, 31 years old, uh, last seen irritating Heat fans by, <laughs> by saying, saying that. Just because, of, I, j- just because of his face. Just because of his, that's, why, that's why I'm going with him ahead of McDermott, uh, which is a deal I don't understand. Uh, the Doug McDermott deal or the Van Vliet deal, which I like with Toronto, and the DeAndre Jordan deal, which is no risk in Dallas, except it basically eliminated Whiteside as an option uh, it, with the Mavericks. But the Ilyasova deal, I, I like this deal a lot. Um, $7 million a year uh, for a guy who is a proven playoff performer. And I, to me, Giannis just needs guys he can trust there. Like, uh, you know, Jabari Parker is really talented, but like I, they just don't seem to fit. And, and Jabari can't, you know, ha, not his fault. He hasn't stayed healthy. But to me, that's the thing about the Milwaukee roster. Like Bledsoe's up and down. Tony Snell's up and down. Like, Ilyasova, like you kind of know what you're getting, right? Like he's going to, you know, throw some elbows, make some faces. He'll hit some threes. He'll grab some rebounds. Like I, to me at three years, I also think, you know, when he's 34, his $7 million is not going to look too bad. Um, Again, James Johnson is probably a better player than Ilyasova. He's more multidimensional, but he's not 30 my, $39 million better. Um, And, and that's, sure. we come back to where we started the pod. Like, you know, James Johnson at four for 60 or Ilya Silva for three for 21. And it kind of tells you like what the heat to close here, what the heat did last summer. Not only did it take them out of the room for the big time free agents, you know, to have a shot at a Paul George, at least to have a conversation with him. I, forget LeBron. OK, but like Paul George, some of these other guys who've gone here uh, who have not who have, you know, moved teams or at least considered moving teams. But to me, and there hasn't been a huge amount of them, but to me, the other thing it did was it took them out of the running for sort of the cut rate role player um, because they overpaid their own role players. And so, you you know, I mean, you, you look at this right now, like you paid you paid $60 million for James Johnson. You This year, you could have gotten McDermott, Van Vliet, and Ilyasova for a total of, uh, you want to guess the number? $60 million. Yeah. Okay. So McDermott, Ilya Silver, and Van Vliet for a combined eight years at sixty, or James Johnson for four years and sixty. That yeah. that to me that that encapsulates it's bad business. It's the bad problem. business. It, yeah, it's and it's not like them. And that's uh, we keep harping on it, but it strikes me. And I come back to this. Uh, I kind of know who the emotional people are in there, and the kind of the ones who aren't. And I so that it I, you know I don't have any information on this. I don't again. So I'm not putting. But it just. It's hard for me to believe that the whole organization, the whole front office wanted to go that direction. It, I don't have any information otherwise, but it just strikes me as odd that because it does, it's just not very heat like. Um, and so I think that's that's where we are. And so I, I think what we're hoping for is we watch Derek Jones, as we watch Bam Adebayo, as we watch even uh, the kid Duncan Robinson that looks good in summer league, that the Heat don't overpay the role players anymore because they can find and develop those guys. They don't, they don't need to overpay them. Yeah, so. they, they can they can just keep going again and finding these guys. It's, I would say the thing that they've done best since LeBron left. Yes, yeah, they got back to it. They didn't they didn't do it when LeBron was here, Chris. I I, I think part of it was I think there's two reasons for it. Um, one, I don't think they thought those guys would be ready to play with LeBron anyway. Um, because when you're with LeBron, I mean, you you want Shane Batty and Ray Allen. You don't want or you want to see what Greg Oden or Michael Beasley can give you. You don't want to wait on a Terrell Harris, right? Like to to show something or Mikel Gladness or any of the other guys that they looked at. But but I also think they just simply got away from it. Like they didn't, they weren't doing it as much. And they made changes. Like they made changes. They put more of a priority on what was there again at the time, D League affiliate, now G League. They they put more manpower there. Um, they improved the coaching staff there. And they also changed their staff. And and Eric got developmental guys on his staff instead of sort of more grizzled people that he had before, you know, people who who could put had the energy and the capability at that time to put in the time with these guys, guys like Quinn and Juwan. And that's worked. And that's been a tremendous change for the organization, really positive. And so I just wish they had acknowledged it and not gone the other direction last summer. That's kind of, and so that's where we are. So I think that's a good way to end this one. Um, hopefully things will change for the Heat in that regard and they can kind of get back in the right uh, right direction. We will be potting again a couple of times next week. If there's Kawhi news, uh, that's probably what we will get into. But again, check out the Heat Stories pod that we're doing with Brian Grant or did with Brian Grant. Uh, we will get that to you after the weekend. 